When I was growing up in southern Wisconsin, the little town I grew up in didn't have a lot going on, wasn't a lot to do. But there was one very special place. Uh, it was a place that kind of highlighted the culmination of culture at the time. It was a, a place that was, in a way, kind of a, a showcase of the pinnacle of human uh, creativity and ingenuity. It was a really magical place. It was called Walmart. Maybe some of you have been to one before. And in the summer when it was really hot, my friends and I would get on our bikes and we would ride to Walmart to enjoy the air conditioning. Uh, when I was in middle school, we added onto our house and we got an air conditioner, but we weren't ever allowed to use the air conditioner. So it was there. So we would go to Walmart to enjoy the air conditioning and we would just kind of burn as much time as we could. We'd beeline it towards the fishing department and see what kind of new fishing stuff they had in stock. And we would go to the electronics department and I remember they had a, a Nintendo set up that you could play on and so we'd bird time doing that. But one of my favorite things to do was go to the magazine section and see if they had any new comic books in stock. They didn't stock a lot, but the ones that they had, I loved. And I'm not a huge comic book guy, but I loved to draw when I was younger, and I loved to look at the artwork in the comic books, and if I would save up, I'd buy them, I'd bring them home, and I would see if I could copy some of the artwork work in the comic books. I want you to imagine taking a comic book, right? Just pick your favorite comic, if some of you have them. Take a Spider-Man, Batman, Wolverine, The Punisher. Just imagine a comic book, okay? You go to the comic book store, you pull one off the shelf, and then you go back in time 2,000 years to the people living in the ancient city of Ephesus, and you hand them the comic book, and you say, what do you think? They're probably going to be amazed, right? They're going to, I'm sure, like the artwork like everyone else does, but they're going to be wondering what to do with this thing, because they don't understand what that book is. They, they don't have a, a literary category for a modern comic book. And so you can imagine them wrestling with the story that unfolded in this comic book. And you can almost picture, if you did that, that we would go back now and unearth different things in the ancient city of Ephesus and find statues to Spider-Man there because this new deity had been presented to them, right? The point is that you can't take a piece of literature that someone is totally unfamiliar with, they have no category for, they're not familiar with the genre, give them that literature and expect them to intuitively understand it. The book of Revelation is kind of like that for us. It's a, a, a genre that we don't intuitively understand. The ancient people did. For those seven churches of Asia that John addressed this letter to, they had a category for this kind of literature. It was apocalyptic in nature, and they knew what a Jewish apocalypse was. They had places like Daniel in the Old Testament that they were familiar with, and they knew what to expect when they read a book like this. But for a lot of us today, we don't know what to expect. And so the Rev book of Revelation for a lot of people today has become a very intimidating book. In fact, I think for most Christians, probably the most intimidating. It's either the most intimidating or the most fascinating, and there's not a lot of in-between. Either people avoid it or they obsess over it. Either people say they have no idea what it's about, or I figured it out and listen to me because this crazy idea I have is exactly what the book of Revelation is about, right? You probably have somebody you work with or a relative who loves the book of Revelation is going to tell you exactly how they've cracked the code and how they figured it out. This is what we do with the book of Revelation. And I want to talk about the book of Revelation today, and particularly the imagery embedded within the book of Revelation. One of the things about apocalyptic literature is that it is full of imagery, and the book of Revelation is no different. And I want to focus in on one particular example of imagery in the book of Revelation to do a couple things. One, to show you that you don't have to be afraid of this book, but number two, to show you how powerful this imagery can really be. And so what we're going to do today and next Sunday is talk about the lamb that was slain. And so I hope you'll open up your Bibles with me. We're going to be all over scripture this morning, and I'm going to try to talk kind of rapidly to cover everything that I have in store for you this morning. But we're going to start here in Revelation chapter 1. And so if you turn over with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 1, and right away we have some imagery. As John is introducing this letter to us, and he's explaining to his audience what this is, and particularly who it's from, this is a letter from 
Jesus, a vision given to John through an angel so that he might take that message and give it to the seven churches of Asia. And of course, then recorded and handed down even to us today. But if you look with me at Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 4, John says this, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. And I want you to listen to how he begins to describe Jesus here, the imagery that he uses. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. That's an enormous title to ascribe to someone, the ruler of all the kings on earth. And yet, that's exactly the title that John gives to Jesus. And so this image is painted of Jesus as a supreme ruler, not one of the mighty kings on earth, but the ruler of all the kings on earth. And this image of Jesus as king shouldn't really take us by surprise because that image of kingship is often associated with Jesus in Scripture. We're used to thinking about Jesus as a king. But what kind of king was he? And the way that you answer that question in your own mind has an enormous impact on the way that you understand and interpret and apply Scripture. And so we go from this illustration of Jesus as ruler of kings on earth, and we go throughout the book of Revelation If you just survey the rest of chapter 1, he uses other imagery here. For example, he refers to him as one like the Son of Man. Well, instantly our minds go to who when we hear that image? To Jesus. Because when Jesus was on earth during his earthly ministry, he loved to refer to himself by that title. People like to refer to him as what? Son of David and all the messianic hope that was tied up in it. But when Jesus was talking about himself... He was talking about the Son of Man. And of course, he didn't just pull that image out of thin air. That image, that title, that terminology is borrowed itself from the book of Daniel. And it has everything to do with what God has in store for a kingdom that he was going to establish that was going to last forever and ever. And that's the point of what I want to get you to see today, is that some of the images that we see come to life in the book of Revelation are not plucked out of thin air. They're not images that John fabricated on his own. They are borrowed from other places in Scripture. And so they bring with them meaning, heavy meanings, important meanings. They are embedded with meaning. And you have to be familiar with those images for them to make sense in their context here in the book of Revelation. It makes sense to us to think about Jesus as a ruler, as a king, because that's how we understand the Messiah in the Christ. By the way, Christ in Messiah... Jesus' last name is not Christ. I hope you understand that. It's not Jesus Christ, okay? Christ is a title. And Christ and Messiah both mean the same thing. They mean anointed one. And when you cast your mind back to imagery in the Old Testament, when you think about those who were anointed, not always, but most of the time, who was it that was being anointed? Kings and rulers. And so this is what the Jews were expecting when they talked about the coming of the Messiah or the coming of the Christ. It was the ruler, the king that they were hoping for, the one that God had promised to them. And so Jesus is presented to us first with this imagery of a king. But then we get to chapter 5. And this is where I really want to focus our attention this morning, is there's two more images given of Jesus here. And one of them, I think, is surprising. And we're going to talk about why. So let me just set the stage for what's happening. In Revelation chapter 4, a door is opened into heaven. And John is given this glimpse into the throne room of God. And God sits supreme on his throne. And all of the heavenly host is gathered around him, worshiping him, praising him, giving him the praise that is due him. And then we transition into chapter 5, and a scroll is presented. But something terrible happens. There's this scroll, and everybody's dying to know what's on the scroll, except no one can be found in all of heaven and on all of earth that's worthy to open this scroll until 
someone is found who is worthy. And we're introduced to that character here. So if you follow along with me in Revelation chapter 5, let me just start in verse 1. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began, this is John speaking, I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. I don't think John fully understands what's going on, but he understands that what's on that scroll is vitally important. And it breaks his heart to know that no one is worthy to open it. But then we get to verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So now we're introduced to Jesus again in chapter 5, except he's not called by name here, is he? John uses two different uh, descriptive terms to help us understand who this person is that's found worthy to open the scroll. And in all of heaven and in all of earth, he's the only one worthy to open the scroll. How was he described? Two different ways. The lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. Well, what is that? In reference to, and again, I want to show you how this is borrowing from Old Testament images and terminology. These are things that already had meaning. And these first century Christians would have understood the meaning of these descriptive phrases, these images. If you go back to Genesis chapter 49, let's talk about the Lion of Judah for just a second. In Genesis chapter 49, this is actually um, right, right in line with uh, what Glenn's been doing on Wednesday nights, working through the end of Genesis here recently. As Jacob is facing his own death, he calls his sons to him, and he begins to address them one by one. And he begins to talk about what was in store for them after his death, either being critical of the men that they had been or giving them blessings after he was going to be gone. And in chapter 49, verse 8, he begins to address Judah. And listen to what he says. Genesis 49, verse 8. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. He's describing what is in store for the lineage of Judah, that the scepter shall never depart from them. That kingship and rulership and authority are going to be associated with the descendants of the house and the tribe of Judah. And this image is now tied to that rulership and that kingship of Judah. And what is the image? The image of a lion. And so the the lion of Judah. Well, if we trace Judah's lineage forward, what great king in Israel's history came from the line of the the line, excuse me, not lion, line of Judah? David did. It was David. Right? And David represents the pinnacle of kingship in Israel's history. They look back towards David and they look forward to David because God had made a promise to David. If you remember, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David gets the idea, I live in this beautiful home and God's still in a tent. So what did he want to do? Build a temple, a permanent structure for God to dwell in. But God sends a message to David through the prophet Nathan. You remember what he said? He said, from the beginning until now, I've been going about in a tent. And I never asked anybody to build me a house of cedar. And so he's going to permit David's lineage, David's son Solomon, eventually to build him a temple. But in the meantime, God says this to David. He says, you want to build me a house, but I tell you what I'm going to do, David. I'm going to build you a house. And you're going to have a son. And that son is going to be a different kind of king. Because I promise you that that son is going to inherit your kingdom in a way that it's not been realized on earth before. He's going to inherit a kingdom that will know no end. And of course, some of that applies to Solomon, his direct lineage, but it finds its ultimate fulfillment in who? In Jesus, right? In Jesus, the Lion of Judah. 
All right, so we find this imagery in Old Testament Scripture. What about the root of David? Well, the same thing is true. In Isaiah chapter 11, in verse 1, is we're introduced to this messianic figure embedded throughout the book of Isaiah. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. It's a weird image, but if you go back in the previous chapter, this whole forest has been burned to the ground, and there's nothing left but stumps. It's all death. There's nothing left. There's no life. But then from one of those stumps comes a shoot. There shall come from a sh- uh, forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. In that day, he goes on in verse 10, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for all the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Again, pointing us towards not just the kingship of David, but what would happen after that. And all this is tied in with the hope of Jesus. Do you remember the, the sermon that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? We love that sermon, right? Because it ends with a plea for people to do what? Repent and be baptized, right? So we love going back to that sermon. But what is at the heart of that sermon? Peter is talking about David, the one that they look to as the ultimate king, but he tells them David died and he's buried. And at the time he said, we can go and do what? Visit his tomb to this day. David died and he stayed dead. We're worshiping a different kind of king and I'm here to proclaim to you someone who came from the line of David that died but he's not in a tomb anymore because he came out of that tomb and so we're here to worship the resurrected Christ and and that's what Peter does on that day, the very first day the gospel is proclaimed in Jerusalem. He proclaims him, this Lord and Savior, this Christ that you crucified. He is the king that you were waiting for but all of this imagery is found throughout scripture and so just simply put, when we're introduced to David as the root of David, or excuse me, when we're introduced to Jesus as the root of David and as the lion uh, of Judah, these are images that come from old, the Old Testament and are closely associated with kingship and rulership. This is who Jesus is. He is the ruler of kings on earth. None of this should be surprising to us. This is how we expect Jesus to be introduced to us and described to us. But what is interesting is what happens next. We go from this conquering lion, the embodiment of power and authority and kingship, to a different kind of image. In chapter 5 and verse 6 then, John goes on and he says this, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw not a lion anymore, but a lamb. It's the same character, But that lion has transitioned into a different kind of image. The lion has turned into a lamb, but not any kind of lamb. I saw a lamb standing as though it was slain. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Now I want you to use your imagination. John wants you to use your imagination. This is why Revelation is so full of this kind of imagery. He wants these images to be dancing in your head as you picture this scene unfolding in the throne room. You think about a lamb that was slain. And what does that lamb look like in your mind? How do you know that it was slain? Because it's covered in what? Blood. This is what we're picturing. This is what we're supposed to picture. This lion, this ultimate symbol of authority has turned into a bloody lamb, a lamb that was slain. But the lamb isn't laying down dead, is it? It's doing what, as he's introduced to him here? It's standing. How can that be? How do we go from the image of conquering and rulership to the image of a sacrifice? And how is that the same person that's being referenced here? So what about this image of a lamb? Where does this come from? Should it catch us off guard? Or would they have also looked to the Old Testament to find meaning in this image? And the answer is yes, they would have. Just a few examples. Look at Genesis chapter 22, if you would. Genesis chapter 22. This is a vitally important story. It's the story where God asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And it's a story that is the foundation of our faith. But it's also a story that's worth wrestling with. Because if you're honest with yourself, you read this story for the first time and you have to ask the question, why is God doing this? 
And what are we supposed to learn about God from this story? Let me just read through the first eight verses, if you would. Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Isn't it interesting that God points that out? Your only son, Isaac. Do you think Abraham needed to be reminded of that reality? Who was Isaac to Abraham? He was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to him, that from you I will make a mighty nation. But Abraham and Sarah were way beyond the age when you have children. But God opened Sarah's womb anyway, and a child was born to them. Isaac, he is the child of promise, a gift that God had given Abraham and his wife at a time when they should have least expected it. So Abraham knows who Isaac is, and he understands the value of Isaac, but God is just driving that point home. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. How does this make any sense? This son that God had promised Abraham, he finally gives him, and now he says, go and offer him as a burnt sacrifice? And the most remarkable thing here is that Abraham does it. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering. I want you to pay attention to this part. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Tell me this is not foreshadowing the sacrifice of Christ. Take your only son and offer him up as a sacrifice. And oh, by the way, your son's going to carry his own wood to the place of his death. You think about Jesus carrying that cross to Golgotha. So much foreshadowing happening in this chapter. And so naturally, Isaac's going to have some questions Okay, Dad, I understand what we're here to do, but something is missing. We've got all the stuff for the fire. Something is suspiciously absent. And Isaac said to his father, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? <clears throat> and I, I, I want you to pause for a moment, parents. And I want you to think about the weight of this story. And I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Abraham, knowing what he's been asked to do and having to answer that question from your son. It is impossible as a parent not to connect with this story emotionally. And I am convinced that that is the whole point of this story, is that we do connect with it emotionally. And that Abraham was able to connect emotionally with what God was describing to him here the cost of the sacrifice that was going to be required. As a parent, you cannot fathom a situation where you would sacrifice your child because as a parent, your natural inclination is to do what? Sacrifice yourself for the sake of your child, right? And so the story is all backwards. And so the question is asked, my father, here's the fire, here's the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, and Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. Did God provide the sacrifice? He did. They found a, a ram stuck in its horns in a thicket, right? Did Abraham sacrifice his son? No, because that was not God's intention. God's intention here was to help Abraham connect emotionally with what God had in mind for the redemption of man. God is illustrating to Abraham that, Abraham, I'm not going to ask you to sacrifice your son on my behalf. I'm going to sacrifice my son on your behalf. When you think about this image of a lamb that was slain, it connects so powerfully back to some of the most important stories in Scripture. This being the first one. And then we get to the Exodus story. In Exodus Chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, when we hear God's plan for how he was going to actually redeem Israel. And I, I want to be careful here because the lamb that was sacrificed and eaten at the Passover was not 
atoning in nature. In other words, that lamb was not sacrificed like would be on the day of atonement for the atoning of sins. That's not the story of the Exodus. God isn't forgiving sins here. God is dealing out retribution and judgment on the people that had unfairly held his people in oppression. This is an act of judgment, but it's also an act of redemption. And so they sacrifice that lamb. This is what it says. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. You remember the rest of the story. They ate it together in preparation for their journey. But what did they do specifically with the blood of the lamb? They smeared it on what? On the doorposts, right? And that became symbolic of two things. Number one, that the people that had that blood of the lamb on their doorposts, who were those people? They were Yahweh's people. They were not the Egyptians. They were the children of God. This was God claiming ownership on them. And the second was that as the angel came through and dealt out justice and retribution, those who had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, what would happen to them? They would be, where do we get the name of the feast? They would be passed over, right? And so again, this image of a lamb that was slain, a lamb covered in blood, connects us emotionally back to some of the most powerful stories in Scripture. We've got Abraham and Isaac. We've got the Passover story. We go to Isaiah chapter 53, one of the most powerful messianic passages in Scripture. This is the passage, if you remember, in Acts chapter 8. The Spirit sends the Ethiopian eunuch uh, a visitor by the name of Philip. And Philip is studying with him, right? He goes up to him in his chariot, and he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And you remember the question he asks him? Do you understand what you're reading? And he says, what? How can I unless someone helps me? Tell me who this is about. Is it about the author or somebody else? Which is a natural question to ask if you read through Isaiah 53. And you remember how Luke describes that encounter? He says, beginning with that passage, he did what? Preached Jesus to him. In Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. But Jesus isn't named in Isaiah 53, no. But Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. The messianic hope tied up in Isaiah chapter 53. And here's the image that we find of that suffering servant that would come as a sacrifice for the redemption of God's people. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Man, when you're introduced to Jesus as the line of Judah, you want to jump up and scream, there's my king, right? And then all of a sudden he transforms into this bloody lamb and you're thinking, how do these things go together? But think about the power in the imagery of sacrificial lambs in the Old Testament. We understand what John is trying to communicate to us there, don't we? And then we get into the New Testament John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42, we get this encounter where John is paving the way for the coming Christ. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, which Stefan read for us before our lesson this morning. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The whole point is that it shouldn't catch us off guard when we see Jesus as both the conquering lion and the sacrificial lamb, because he is both of those things. He is ruler of kings on earth, but he's also that lamb that was sacrificed on our behalf. And that image becomes so powerful to us because we understand something that makes no sense to the world around us. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Worthy are you. Something happens. In chapter 4, God is on the throne. And the heavenly hosts surround the throne and they worship God because He's the only one worthy of worship. But then, in chapter 5, they begin to worship not just God, the Father on the throne, but the Lamb at His side. Now Jesus is worthy of worship as well. Worthy are you, they begin to say, addressing the Lamb. To take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God. And from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them, us, a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign 
on the earth. We are introduced to a king. His name is Jesus. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the embodiment of power and authority and strength and might. And he's also a lamb covered in his own blood. He is both of those things simultaneously. And the world will say, how can that possibly be? Because that's not what conquering and power and might look like, but it does to God. And it does in the person of Jesus. And he's made us a kingdom. And we're priests, every one of us, in that kingdom. And so here's what I want you to understand in conclusion. The whole book of Revelation is a searing indictment against Babylon. Of course, Babylon had come and gone. Babylon wasn't there anymore. But Babylon is a stand-in for every human institution. Every empire that ever was and every empire that ever will ever be is Babylon. For them at the time, in the first century, Babylon was Rome, right? And Babylon's priority, every human empire's priority, is to take human lives captive through an exertion of force. This is what Babylon does. But the Lamb's priority is totally different. The Lamb's priority is to take human hearts captive through an act of sacrificial love. What do we learn from all this? What does the image of the Lamb that was slain tell us about Jesus? That He is a king, but He's a different kind of king ruling over a different kind of kingdom. And so the question we have to ask as we move forward is, for those of us who are priests in that kingdom, for those of us who would pledge allegiance to the Lion of Judah and the sacrificial lamb, what does it look like to live in that kingdom? And what can we expect in this life as citizens of that kingdom? And that's where the book of Revelation has some surprising and encouraging things to say to us even today. And so I hope you'll join us next week as we continue to explore this image of the lamb that was slain. But for now, I want to remind you of something. Paul tells us in the book of Philippians that there will come a day on Christ's return where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is ruler of kings on earth. You have an opportunity now to make that confession and to live under his kingship and to enjoy all the benefits of that kingdom, what it looks like to be a citizen in the kingdom of the Most High God. And if you want to do that this morning, if you want to know more about that kingdom, if you want to study about it, if some of this is still making no sense to you and you have questions, whatever it is, we are here to serve you, and we'd like to offer you that opportunity this morning. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing one more song. And as we do that, I'm going to be over here. If you'd like to talk to me here now, you're welcome to do that. If you'd like to grab me afterwards, please do so. If you'd like to talk to one of our shepherds this morning, please do that. But whatever it is, however we can serve you, please let us know how. Let's stand and let's sing this song. Your gift of